morning. So good to see everybody out this Resurrection Sunday morning. What a great day to be in the house of the Lord, and we would love to welcome each and every one of you, especially if you're visiting with us this morning. I just want to say this. Uh, I was sitting uh, yesterday morning doing my devotional, and I just couldn't help but think about Saturday. Because, you know, you go through the awful events of Good Friday, and, you know, there's so much sorrow got to be filling those people's hearts back in those days, so much uncertainty. And I sit there, as I sit there and thought about that, I thought, man, but we know Sunday's coming. And I'm thinking to myself, man, we are blessed folks to be able to know the outcome of the story and to be able to know that when we close our eyes for the final time, if we've placed our trust in Jesus Christ, we get to see him and we get to experience that true resurrection. And so my prayer is that this morning, that's what you guys have been praying for, is that not just today we see Jesus Christ high and lifted up, but every day in our lives we see Jesus Christ high and lifted up. That way he can draw all men to himself and they can experience that same hope and peace that we have. If you got a bulletin and you want to turn and to the, see the announcements that we've got going on, we've got a bridal shower that's happening April the 28th uh, for Miss Gabby Prather. They're going to be at the home of Miss um, Miss Whitney Bowen. You can see the address, the time, the date, and all that kind of stuff there. You've also got a deacon recommendation that's going to uh, be coming up, and you can read that. Uh, it's, be, it's to help a church in India, one that Brother Andy goes to, uh, that's going to be going to pretty quickly. So uh, you got uh, Simpson County Bicentennial uh, Regional Center. It's going to be an actual service and all. Going to be, I believe there's a combined choir that's going to be there. It's going to be a good time. Uh, you can read about that. Associational and Church Bible Drills is coming up on April the 7th and the 10th. Got a big children's event on April the 13th. Uh, got a senior adult rally on April the 28th. And then we also have a women's uh, countywide rally going to be happening here on Saturday, May the 4th, uh, 10 a.m. until noon p.m. And you can read all about that information there. Any other announcements that we need to have this morning before we go any further? All right. Well, if not, uh, don't forget this will be the only service of today. So let's just worship and praise the Lord above that he does something incredible today. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for just a great, great day. Uh, every day is a great day, but Father God, to be in your house on what this day represents, that you came, gave your life, and then rose again, Father God, so we could have life and we could experience true life. And pray that that's what we do this morning, is we just worship you, that we clear the distractions and everything that may be in our hearts and minds out, so we can focus totally on you this morning, Father God. And I pray that you receive all the honor and glory for everything that takes place. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Didn't we have a good time Friday night? Wonderful time, wonderful time. And we're going to sing Victory in Jesus for our fellowship song, 499. We'll sing all three stanzas, and then we'll fellowship. Okay, would you stand as we sing? 499. Need a loud sound out of this group.
as old as I am, remember where you are or you can just stay right where you are. Okay? Let's, let's fellowship. Let's sing first, second, and third stanzas.
He's alive forevermore. And to this morning, we gather in the presence of the King, King Jesus. And I'm going to ask you right now to stand in awe and reverence of our King of Kings. Would you stand right now as we go to the Lord in prayer? We stand in the presence of the King. Jesus, we thank you that we have the privilege to gather here on this most holiest of all Sundays, Resurrection Sunday. Lord, we thank you that you are here with us. We thank you that we've been privileged to gather in your presence, and we acknowledge you are the King of all kings. You're the living Lord. You are he who was dead, yet is alive forevermore. And Lord, we thank you for the, the presence of your Holy Spirit here this morning. Lord, we're praying that you'd have your will and your way in our individual lives, in the lives of our families, and in the life of this church. God, would you just move and have your will. Lord, we pray that if there's any decisions that need to be made today, Lord, maybe it's a decision of confession, of repentance. Maybe it's a decision of rededication to serve you, our King, our Savior. Maybe it's a decision to come and be saved. Lord, we pray for all those right now. And maybe some here today, Lord, are looking for a church home, and we pray that this would be the home that they'd find to serve you, our risen Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have defeated every enemy. You've conquered death, and you've conquered hell, and you've conquered the grave, and you walked right out of it on Sunday morning. And, Lord, we thank you that we have the privilege to gather, not only this Sunday, but every Sunday to remember what you have done in giving your life's blood on Calvary's cross, paying the penalty we could never pay for our sin, and rising again to prove you've got the power to save. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being our Lord. Thank you for being our living King. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. choir at this time would like to sing lead me back to Calvary
Thank you for that beautiful song. Our offertory today will be 258. Blessed Redeemer, 258. And I'll ask you to stand, please, as we sing the first and third stanzas song. 258. And ushers, you come on the last stanza, please.
Aren't you so thankful that we can steal glory in the cross? I'm only standing now because of mercy. I'm nothing but a trophy of God's grace poured out upon a soul so undeserving. When on a cruel cross he took my place. The many years of faith are now behind me. I have not forgotten what my freedom cost. For every day I wake in to new wonders. And that's why I so glory in the cross. I still glory. sinless blood shed for me that still flows freely from the cross today I still glory the cross the cross of Calvary for I would still Jesus paid it for me, and the cross still tells the story. That's why I still glory. That's why I still.
Wow. We glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. Only God could take an old rugged cross, an instrument and in death of death, and turn it into the beautiful symbol of eternal life. Amen. We've worshiped together here the last several weeks and uh, in fact good friday and we've had different colors of fabric on the cross we've seen the purple of the cross representing the royalty of king jesus and we've seen the red on the cross on good friday representing his shed blood and he shed his blood for you and for me amen and then today we see the white on the cross it represents our living lord he's alive forevermore amen and so with that, turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. The glory of Jesus as he walked out of that tomb is what we want to focus on today. And I'm praying that God is going to show you and me a vision through his word of the risen Lord Jesus. Now the women were coming to the tomb in Luke chapter 24 very early in the morning and we have come to church very early in the morning and these women were looking for something but they were looking for the wrong thing they were looking for a dead jesus they were coming to anoint his dead body with spices and ointments early in the morning i can imagine the birds were beginning to chirp maybe the sun was just beginning to peek over the garden and the rocks there in the garden tomb and the, the dew covered the ground as they trod their way with tears and with sadness and with emptiness and all their hopes had been dashed and they came to the tomb and so it says in Luke chapter 24 verse let's just pick it up at verse 1 now on the first day of the week very early in the morning they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They did not find what they were looking for. God had something better. Amen. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men, these were angels, stood by them in shining garments, and they, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said unto them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And the Bible says, and they remembered his words. And this morning I'm praying that you and I will remember his words that Jesus was crucified. He alone could pay the penalty for our sin. And he did it on the cross, and he proved it when he said, it is finished. And then he was buried. Jesus died. He died physically. He died a death, a cruel death, that none of us would ever have to suffer. But Jesus died, and he was dead and placed in a tomb. And the Bible teaches it was a borrowed tomb because he didn't need it very long amen because on the third day jesus rose again christ is risen he's risen indeed why do you seek the living among the dead maybe you've come here today and you've been looking for something in your life and you didn't know exactly what to expect today we welcome you here we're glad that you're here at corinth baptist church I'm hoping you'll find something you weren't looking for. Maybe you were looking for a good service of good music, and haven't we been blessed this morning? Hadn't God blessed this church with music? Can we give our choir and instrumentalist and Brother Donald and our trio a great thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for using your gifts and talents to serve the living Lord Jesus. Maybe you came here for the music. Maybe you came here because it's just the thing to do on Easter Sunday. I'm praying that you're going to find an encounter and your life will be forever changed by the living Lord Jesus. Don't look for the dead here. He's not here. He's risen. Amen. He's alive. We don't serve a dead Jesus. We serve a living Jesus. His Holy Spirit proves it to us. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. 
He walks with me and talks with me along life's weary way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And if you're a Christian here this morning, you know what I'm talking about. Not just on a Sunday and not just on a Monday, but all week long, Jesus walks with us because he's living, he's alive forevermore. Amen. I don't know how people live without King Jesus. We've got a, a government that wants to take Jesus out of everything. I was troubled to read the pronunciation by some of our government that today was some other kind of politically correct day. Let me tell you, today is Resurrection Sunday. It's Jesus Day. And there's no other government can change that because Jesus is the King of Kings and He's the Lord of Lords. Now, Jesus had many different encounters as the living, risen Christ. He appeared to Mary in the garden and she thought He was the gardener. He appeared to the disciples in the upper room and uh, they were shocked to see that Jesus in His resurrected body uh, could walk through doors without even opening them. Isn't it good to know we're going to have a body like Jesus on Resurrection Day, one of these days, amen? A body that's not wasting away, a body that's not hurting anymore, a body that's not suffering anymore, a body that death has no power over anymore. Jesus has that kind of body. And you and I as Christians will inherit the same type of body one of these days, amen? But I want to bring you to an encounter with the King Jesus, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that happened some 60 years later in the book of Revelation. Turn with me, Revelation chapter 1. Now we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. God saw the greatest problem of mankind. It is the problem of sin. It is the problem of death. It is the problem of our eternal separation from God forever. And God saw our problem of sin and God sent Jesus to be our Savior, the Son of God. God took on flesh. He was born and we remember that at Christmas time. He lived the sinless life. He never did anything wrong and yet He willingly laid down His life on the cross to pay our sin penalty. The wages of sin is death, but the, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sixty years after the apostle John knelt inside that empty tomb, the scriptures tell us he and Peter went in and, and John ran faster than Peter and John went in and he knelt and he saw the napkins there folded just so. And that was a sign of Jesus that I'm coming back. Amen. <laughs> the work is not done. God's work is not done. John the Apostle knelt in that empty tomb. Sixty years later, some odd sixty years later, all the other apostles had died. All the other disciples had been martyred, had been killed for the faith because they believed what we believe this morning, Jesus rose from the dead. And they preached it everywhere they went. And they believed it so much they were willing to give their lives for the gospel, for Jesus. And then the last living apostle, the apostle John, who was in prison as an old man on the island of Patmos in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. He's there as a prisoner for Jesus Christ. And there we believe he died of old age in exile. But Jesus was not through with his life and his ministry. And Jesus appeared to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. We're going to pick it up at verse uh, 1. Let's just pick it up at verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. He sent it and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all the things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, those who keep it written in it, for the time is near. John, verse 4, to the seven churches in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. That's a, a representation of the perfect Holy Spirit of God. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us 
and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he's made us to be kings, a kingdom of priests, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. John wrote in verse 7, Behold, Jesus is not done. He said, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. Verse 8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, that Sunday, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write it in a book and send it to the seven churches in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, to Laodicea, John turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. By the way, those represent those seven churches. Jesus is interested in his church. He's interested in Corinth Baptist Church. And if you belong to another local church, Jesus is interested in your church. He's in the midst of his churches. Amen. And in the midst, verse 13, of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about his chest with a golden band. This is a vision of the risen Jesus. His head and his hair were white like wool, white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. His voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth when a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Pause right there one moment. Have you ever tried to look at the sun? Have you ever tried to look at the sun? I don't recommend it. The sun is bright. It's blinding. And the sun has nothing to compare with the glory of the risen Lord Jesus. Jesus' glory outshines the sun. So verse 17, it's no surprise. John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am, notice verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, Jesus said, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of hell. Jesus is the king who holds the keys. Amen. This morning, I want to share with you four characteristics of our risen King Jesus. And these characteristics ought to change your life forever. They ought to change not only your life, but they should change your eternal destiny. If you don't know Jesus, you can know him today and be saved because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the life that God wants for you to have. And if you're a Christian, you already have it. If you're not, you believe on Jesus today, and you can receive it today. Amen? Jesus' characteristics. They're characteristics of our risen king. I want you to notice, first of all, Jesus is the everlasting king. Go back with me to Revelation 1, verse 8, where he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is and who was and who is to come. Jesus is the everlasting king. We do not serve a king who just had a beginning when Jesus was born because the Bible says in the beginning before time ever existed, Jesus was there because Jesus is God, God's Son. Yes, Jesus took on flesh. He became a man, a human being, 100% man, and yet the Bible teaches and we believe he's 100% God. 
And what that means is Jesus is the everlasting king. You think about that. Everything that we know in this life has a beginning and an end. Jesus said, I am the beginning and the end. He never had a beginning. He never started uh, because he has always been God. The Bible says, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. I had a beginning and a birthday, and one day, if the Lord tarries is coming, I'll have a day that my life ends. But Jesus' life has never begun, and it's never going to end because he's the everlasting king. He said, I'm the Alpha. That was the first letter in the Greek alphabet. He said, I'm the Omega. That's the last. And all in between, Jesus is forever. He's the everlasting king. Get a hold of that this morning. We live our lives and we think that things are happening to us that are so important and so crucial. And the fact of the matter is, our lives are like the bat of an eye in the eyes of God. Uh, the, 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 the quickening, the twinkling of an eye. Our life is so short. Listen to me. Life is short. I don't care if you live to be 95 or 100 or 115 years old. Life is short in comparison to eternity. And we serve an eternal king, King Jesus, the one who was and the one who is and the one who is to come. He's never going to have an end. His kingdom will never end. The book of Daniel, uh, Daniel the prophet prophesied this in Daniel chapter 7. I'm going to read a few verses. Da uh, Daniel wrote, he said, I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him. Them to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. Listen to this. His, that is King Jesus' dominion, is an everlasting dominion which shall never pass away. His kingdom is the one which shall never be destroyed. We have the privilege to serve the king of all kings. We have the privilege to be citizens of the kingdom of God and all of the kingdoms of this world. And yes, even one day, the United States of America, this country will pass away. But Jesus' kingdom will never pass away. Make sure you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. He's the everlasting king. Not only that, ladies and gentlemen, he is the almighty king. It says in verse 5, He's the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. It says in verse 8, I am the one who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's a word that we don't use very often in our English today. Almighty God. We can say it so flippantly. Do you know what it means? It means he has all power, all authority, 100% belongs to our king, to King Jesus. Can I get amen right there? all authority, all power. He's the almighty king. He's all powerful. And where is his power exercised? Well, he tells us in this image of Jesus, he says, out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. You see, the only thing Jesus needs to do is speak the word, and it happens. Back in the beginning of time, God looked and he said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, let there be water, and there was water, and the dry land appeared, and it appeared. And Jesus has the power to speak all things because he is the almighty king of kings, all-powerful. Jesus is the almighty king. Luke chapter 22, Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin, the 70 judges of the Jews. He stood there in apparent weakness. He was bound. He was tied. He was led in, as the Bible says, like a sheep to the slaughter. And so he opened not his mouth. But one time he opened his mouth. They asked him, are you the Christ? He says, you've said it. And then he said, one day you're going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. That's the king we serve, King Jesus. And in Matthew 28, as Jesus prepared to ascend, he gave his church its marching orders. And he began those marching orders, the Great Commission, by saying, I am the one who has all power. He said, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. And he said, based on that authority, you can go into all the world and preach the gospel to everybody. Amen? We do it 
in the authority, not of our own authority, but of Jesus' authority. And when we share the gospel, we're trusting in his power. And this morning, I'm preaching the gospel to you, and I'm trusting the power of Jesus to see it take root in your heart. And as Christians, for you to be encouraged by the power of the Lord Jesus. So he's the everlasting king. He's the almighty king. And he's the living king. Verse 17, we celebrate the living Lord Jesus this morning. Verse 17 of Revelation 1, John said, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he said, uh, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Jesus is alive forevermore. We celebrate the Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate this Easter Sunday. And we should never lose sight of the fact we're not celebrating a, just a historical event. We do celebrate that, that Jesus walked out of that grave on the third day. He's risen indeed. But we're celebrating today. Jesus is alive right now. Jesus is here with us right now. He said, as many as two or three gathering in my name, Jesus said, I will be there with him. And we're so blessed we hadn't had any room in this church except the front pews within spitting distance this morning. And certainly, Jesus is gathered here with us. He's with us. He's alive. He's living. I want you to listen to what Jesus is saying this morning. I am he who was dead and is alive forevermore. Jesus is alive. He's the living king. I want to share with you, some of you have encountered the difficulties of death in recent days. Some of your families have, I know that. And we've been praying for you, for all of us, for we all will encounter death at some point. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the promise of Jesus' resurrection. He says, if Christ has been preached that he has been raised from the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, 12, how do you, some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? He goes on to say, if in this life only that we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. We don't serve a dead Jesus. We don't serve a Jesus who no longer lives. We serve a, serve a living Lord Jesus. And his life makes a difference in how we live. And then he goes on to say, but now Christ has risen from the dead. And he's become the first fruits of them that have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. And, and Adam all die. And in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in its own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. We have a fig tree, a couple of them actually on our farm. And uh, wow, they had a tough year last year. The freeze got them, and then the drought hurt them, but I noticed they're coming back from the roots. And by the way, springtime itself is a picture of the resurrection. Everything that looks so dead, and suddenly it's alive and green and verdant and blossoming again, that's the power of God. It's the power of resurrection. But the fig trees, that they're coming back from the roots, and I trimmed off the dead the other day, I noticed even as weakened as they are, there's still some little first fruits. There's some little early figs coming on those fig trees. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about this morning? Some of you do. Figs normally come into season. They become ripe, and we go out and enjoy them in July, late July or August, and they're so juicy, and we love to make fig preserves and other things, and uh, I love a spread of fig just plain on my biscuits. Can I get amen right there? It's good. But in the early spring, the little shoots, the tender shoots of the figs will put out what's called early figs. And they're just maybe a handful, maybe two or three. But you know what that's a promise of? As little as it is, as few as there are, it's a promise that there's more where that came from. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he became the first fruits of them who sleep. You've lost a loved one this year, perhaps, or in the years past. I want to tell you, Jesus' resurrection is the promise that we too shall be raised like him. Amen? There's more life where that came from. Jesus is the first fruits. And in God's time, these who are Christ, who've gone to be with the Lord, we too 
shall live again in resurrected, glorified bodies that'll never, ever pass away. Isn't that good news this morning? There's one last point. That is, not only is Jesus the everlasting king and the almighty, all-powerful king, he's the living king, and I hope that you can, like Job, say, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and I will see him at the last day. But finally, he's the king who holds the keys. The keys, verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have, Jesus said, the keys of death and of Hades, of hell. Jesus is the king who holds the keys. I have a set of keys in my pocket. Some of these keys will go into one door or another. Some of them will go into doors that you may never go to. Some of them will... Uh, we share keys to different facilities, and we have some to the church here. Jesus holds the master key. He holds the key of everything. He is the key. He holds the keys of death, and he holds the keys of hell. And Jesus holds the keys to your future. The key represents authority. If you have a set of keys, it allows you to go in. It allows you to go out. It allows you to lock inside and protect. It allows you to lock outside the enemy. Jesus holds the keys. He's the king who holds the keys. He holds the keys of death. When Jesus died on the cross, and he did die, and when he was buried, that's why death had no authority over him. He just unlocked the door and walked right out. Amen? He has the keys of death because Jesus is the king over death. The Bible says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And we all face it. Unless Jesus comes back first, every one of us will face that moment of death. And let me tell you this morning, the only way to face it with certainty is to know the king who holds the keys. Because for the Christian, our last breath in this life is our first breath in heaven. Amen. Jesus holds the keys. He lets us in. And he locks out death. And then he says, I hold the keys of Hades. Now, Hades in the New Testament and in the Old Testament was considered the place where the dead went. And it was as if there were two chambers. Jesus told a parable of a rich man and Lazarus. The rich man died. He lived it up in this life. He died and went to a waiting chamber, a place to go to hell. The, 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 the poor man died, Lazarus, and he died, and he went into Abraham's bosom, a place of paradise to be welcomed into heaven. And Jesus holds those keys, not just of life and not just of death. But listen to me. Jesus holds the keys to eternity. And I want to close where I began, that God loved you so much, and he loved me so much, and he loved the whole world so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Life forever with the risen king. Life forever with the everlasting king. Life forever with the all-powerful king, the living king, the king who holds the keys. But if you don't know Jesus, there is another place it's a place called hell. And Jesus also holds those keys. And the Bible says hell was a place prepared for the devil and his angels. And one day, the devil himself will be cast into that pit and held forever. And those who rejected Christ will spend eternity separated eternally from the goodness of God. Jesus does not want that for you. He proved it by coming, by living the sinless life that he lived, by going to the cross, by shedding his blood. He opened his arms this wide. He said, I love you that much. And he died. He gave up the ghost to give you the free gift of eternal life. A gift is wonderful, but it's only good if you receive it. Have you received the free gift of God's eternal life? salvation in Jesus Christ. He's the one who holds the keys. Receive him today. If you have never been saved, you need to come this morning, and I'd love to pray with you and help you to find Jesus. 
Maybe you're here this morning and you've got a vision of the living Lord and you need to come and bow at this altar and pray and ask God to help you by his grace to serve the Lord more than you have in the past, better than you have yesterday. The good news is if you're living, Jesus is not done with you. Amen. If you're alive, God has good plans for you. You come and rededicate your life to Christ. And maybe you're looking for a place to put down roots, to, to serve the living Lord. We do it every week here at this church, and we're so grateful for the opportunity. With Sunday school and, and morning worship and our nighttime classes at 5 o'clock, and we learn more about Jesus, more about Jesus. We can never get enough of Lord Jesus. And evening uh, services, Wednesday night prayer meeting. We would love for you to plug in. We'd love for you to be involved in the children's group, the youth group. We'd love for you to plug in with the Sunday school classes and the choir and all the ways that we have the privilege to serve our living Lord. He's the king. Because he's the eternal king, we owe him our time. Because he's the eternal king, uh, we owe him our abilities because he's given all of our abilities to us. He's the almighty king. We owe him our gifts and our talents because he is the living king. We owe Jesus our lives. And because he's the king who holds the keys, we have the privilege to tell everybody we know Jesus is coming soon. Receive him. Be saved. That's why we have a church. And that is the invitation for you this morning. Whatever God has laid on your heart, would you give God back in response what he's asked of you today? And let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to have an invitation, and I don't want you to wait. If God's spoken, I want you to come. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that we serve you, our living king. You are the almighty king. You are the everlasting king. You taught us all about the kingdom of God, and it begins in our hearts when we receive Christ. Lord, take up your throne in our hearts and our lives. Lord, if there's anyone lost here today, would you save them? May they come and receive Christ. Lord, all of us, the rest of us who are believers, may we serve you, our Lord, with all that we are and all that we have, all our hopes and all our dreams. Lord, help us to reach a world that's desperately hungry to know Jesus. Help us to reach them with the good news that Jesus loves and Jesus saves. And Lord, you take this invitation and may you get all the glory because we ask it in the name above every name, the name at which one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Thank you for being our Lord. Thank you for being our king. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hymn of invitation is hymn number 449, That's Because that. He Lives. Will you stand as we sing? Stand and God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came by my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride. A 
but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know just because he lives. He lives. He lives today. And no matter what you're facing, don't ever forget this, no matter what issue you're facing in life, in death, even for all eternity, Jesus holds the keys. He is the key. And he welcomes you in. God bless you this Easter Sunday. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We're going to go and we're going to celebrate it with our families. We hope you'll do that today. And we'll have no other services today, but we invite you to come back. We will be having prayer meeting on Wednesday night and uh, choir practice, I'm sure, coming up on Sunday evening. And not today. No, not today. Not, not today. That's right. Be with your families today. But we invite you to join us back here next Sunday and uh, all of the services.